Konnichiwa. Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am delighted to welcome you all to a public lecture today with Professor Robert Engel, Nobel Prize Laureate in Economic Sciences and Professor Emeritus of Finance at New York University Stern School of Business. I'm particularly quite happy because uh, I hosted uh, Professor Engel in Johannesburg, and now I am hosting him in Tokyo. And my grandmother would say, this is a sign of good fortunes for United Nations University. This is a special event co-hosted by United Nations University and the International Peace Foundation, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the official relationship between Japan and the Asian region. Professor Robert Engel received the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 2003 for his research on the concept of autoregressive conditional heteroscedacity, which provides methods of analyzing economic time series within time varying volatility. Of course, this is called ACH. The ACH method can clarify market developments where turbulent periods with large fluctuations are followed by calmer periods with modest fluctuations and are particularly relevant to understanding risk management and financial market behavior. I am obviously a big follower of Professor Engel and one of my favorite uh, paper that I read was uh, the paper you co-authored with uh, Clive Granger. And of course, uh, we also know him for a very powerful concept of core integration, go and learn. As a reminder, the format of today's event is a 45-minute lecture by Professor Engel, followed by a 45-minute Q&A session, which I will have the privilege of moderating. We have Japanese language simultaneous interpretation available today. So if you prefer to listen to the lecture in Japanese, please use the headsets we have provided. For those new to United Nations University, Allow me to say a few words about this university. The UN University was established by the UN General Assembly in 1972. I was only one year old. And launched its academic work at our Tokyo headquarters in 1975. Over the decades, UN University expanded and today consists of 13 research institutes located in 12 different countries across the world. We will soon open our 14th institute focusing on artificial intelligence in Bologna in Italy. UN University is an international university that acts as a bridge between academic research and policymakers in the UN system, as well as between academics and policymakers in the global north and the global south. UN University's research spans across the 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and has strong and direct influence on key UN decision-making bodies. Uh, on the sustainable development goals, I had the privilege of, uh, of uh, installing 
and SDG pin on Professor Engel just uh, a few minutes ago. In recent years, the discourse surrounding climate change has intensified with growing recognition of its far-reaching implications for our economy, society, and the environment. As we confront the escalating challenges and uncertainties posed by climate-related risks, there is an urgent need to harness the tools of finance to address these complex issues effectively. So I'm very much looking forward to the valuable insights of Professor Engel uh, that you will share with us today in a lecture titled A Financial Approach to Climate Risk. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres recently stressed at COP28 that much more is needed to deliver climate justice to those on the front lines of the crisis. He stated that, and I quote, Many vulnerable countries are drowning in debt and at risk of drowning in rising seas. It is time for the surge in finance, including for adaptation, loss and damage, and reform of the inter international financial architecture. I will close with a quote from Professor Engel, and I quote, there are some risks we choose to take because the benefits from taking them exceed the possible costs. And that is, of, of course, what we call profit. Optimal behavior takes risks that are worthwhile. This is the central paradigm of finance. We must take risks to achieve rewards, but not all risks are equally rewarded, close quote. I will now ask Uwe Moravets from our co-hosting organization, the International Peace Foundation, to give a few remarks before we welcome Professor Engel. Uwe, you have the floor. Yeah, welcome to the Japan ASEAN Bridges event series, which is facilitated by the Vienna based International Peace Foundation. And the events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including some of the country's main universities. And I would like to thank the United Nations University for hosting our event today. Commemorating the 50th anniversary of official relations between Japan and the ASEAN region, Bridges has been continuously held in Thailand and Japan since November last year, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The Japan ASEAN Bridges Series follows the series of 800 Bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has facilitated since 2003 to support education in the ASEAN region. As peace cannot be achieved instantly, but is a process which needs time, Bridges has not been organized as a single conference, but as an ongoing series of events of now over two decades, in which Nobel laureates and international decision makers have built strong bridges with leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. With the basis for peace being education and synergies being the fruit of cooperation, the International Peace Foundation has not realized bridges alone, but has car carried out the program together with UNESCO and with 179 international and uh, national institutions, including 106 major universities and schools across the Asian region. The multidisciplinary and pluralistic approach of bridges in Thailand, the Philippines, 
Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam, Singapore, Indonesia, Laos, and of the events now in Japan, reflects that peace involves all parts of society. It involves awareness and social responsibility of politicians, the business community, scientists, artists, and the media. And since peace within ourselves, our families, and our environment starts in our minds and hearts, it involves every one of us. In this sense, Bridges challenges us to cross borders and to build bridges by listening and opening up to other viewpoints, by generating new thoughts, by developing innovative forms of cooperation, and by fulfilling the desire of everyone to get to know and to learn from each other. This can lead us to a world in which we will be able to understand each other and the complexities we face today in a new light. So let us be inspired by the knowledge and the wisdom that Bridges continues to offer. An opportunity to get a more inclusive, interconnected, and com comprehensive view of ourselves and the world in which we live in, and which we are able to create anew constantly, through dialogues towards a culture of peace which need the participation of everyone. I thank the 2003 Nobel Laureate for Economics, Professor Robert Engel and Dr. Marianne Engel, who have agreed to come to Japan to support the events, and we now look forward to his speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. A warm welcome, Professor Engel. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Mawala, Mr. Morowitz, and thank you all for coming. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing with you some of the research that we're doing at the Volatility and Risk Institute at New York University, and make some bridges from this uh, research endeavor. Um, I've been asked uh, many, many times what the Nobel Prize was really for, and you've just heard an answer. When I was asked this question in uh, 2003, I couldn't give an answer that didn't require equations and a blackboard and uh, a lot of uh, Greek letters or something like that. Now I can do it in one sentence. It's for a statistical model that's used to predict risk in financial markets. Risk is what I want to talk about today. It's also, I guess, what I was talking about uh, years ago. I'm going to be showing you some pictures from our, a website that our institute has, um, which is updated every day as new information becomes available, and is a free website. You can see it on your phone. Uh, that's the URL. And this particular uh, slide is a compilation of thousands and thousands and thousands of assets which are modeled every day and have a volatility which is computed and synthesized in here for countries, currencies, uh, industries, and commodities. And it gives you an idea of what the risks are that we're seeing, where they are, what countries there are risky, and which currencies are risky, and so forth. It's also nice to see these on a map. And as you can see, this is from my hotel room this morning. This is what the volatility risk looks like around the world. Where it's red is where the stock market is very volatile and risky. And where it's green, the market is pretty peaceful, not much going on. So you can see where the hot spots are. Uh, you see China and Argentina and uh, uh, 
Egypt, and, but uh, not Japan. <laughs> so what I want to do today is really three things. The first thing I want to do is talk about a, a new kind of long-run risk that's particularly relevant for climate change. The second thing is to talk about how we treat these long-run risks in finance and what sort of portfolios might be sensitive to these risks and how we use these portfolios to measure things like greenwashing and uh, financial stability. And then the third part is I'd like to talk about current events. That is, what's going on in the world today that's related to these two first two topics? And can we understand better the issues with climate change uh, from, from what I've shown you so far? So let's start. Um, the science of climate change is pretty clear. The Earth is warming, and that has lots of consequences, which the scientists are only trying to figure out. And those scientific findings are motivating economists to try to figure out what are the damages that are being imposed on our world by climate change. And some of these damages, it appears, Mike, we can deal with. Some of them look like they are very extreme, and we really hope that they don't happen. As we look around us now, we do see already lots of effects of climate change. It's not a question of whether we, having, we have climate change. It's now a question of how bad will it get? And so the main damages that we think about, that we really worry about, are in the future, and perhaps the distant future. And so this poses new problems of analysis for economists to try to forecast what the effects are in the distant future. But in finance, we have this all the time. And so finance provides a good laboratory to look at these kinds of risks. Assets today are affected by what people think is going to happen in the long run. Long run risks, long run benefits are evaluated by investors every day and we see them in today's asset prices. This gives us a, a peek at what the markets think the future looks like. But it's more important than just getting a look at what's going to happen. These are the prices that influence flows of capital today. And when we talk about how do we get capital to flow to the kinds of things we need, we need new renewable energy and we need clean uh, water and things like that, how do we get capital to flow into those directions? It's not by asking nicely, it's by finding that this is profitable. These need to be profitable activities and capital will flow as fast as it's needed. So asset prices direct capital and so it's important for us to understand what makes asset prices move and how they're affected by forecasts of climate in the future. And if you really wonder whether this is a, a serious way to understand the future, um, think about the f two stocks that I have in the last line here. Tesla is trading for about 60 times its current earnings, while as General Motors is trading for about five times its annual earnings. So the financial markets think the future is much brighter for Tesla than they do for GM, even though today they might have similar uh, performance. Forecasts matter. So 
Professor Marwala mentioned that risk is an event that's in the future. If it occurs, it's a, if it's a bad event, if it occurs, you're sorry that it happens, and you have to calculate today what you think the impact of this event would be in order to decide whether it's worth exposing yourself to this event. If you think that this event is so serious, then you try to avoid it. If it's not so serious, maybe it's a worth uh, taking. If this event is distant, is in the distant future, then we call it a long-run risk. And long-run risks are natural to think about in the climate change because, as I say, the worst of these events are far in the future. And if you think the science is pretty precise about it, you might say, well, these are not risks, these are certainties in the future. But many of the risks that we're going to talk about today are not certain in the future because they depend on our behavior. If we do one thing, the risk will be one thing. If we do something else, it'll be different. And most importantly, one of the things that we might do is try to stop climate change. Seems like a good idea, doesn't it? But it depends on how much it costs. Well, that's certainly a calculation that is going on everywhere on this planet, whether it's worth trying to stop climate change or not. And the outcome of this makes the long run very uncertain because it depends on our policymakers uh, and in many different countries. So I think the risk is, risk is the right word to talk about climate change. So I would like to introduce this with an example. This is an example which makes clear what some of the issues are. Suppose you're the owner of a beachfront luxury hotel. It's in a nice part of Japan or someplace else, right on the beach. Everybody loves being on the beach when they uh, go to a, a resort hotel. But the problem is that this hotel faces long run risks, but one in particular is the risk that the sea level is rising. And because that risk is so inexorable, that is, it's really unlikely to stop, you've got to figure this hotel is going to be destroyed at some point in the future. So this is what we call a stranded asset. It's likely to have no value in the future. We don't know exactly when that's going to be but we think it's pretty likely that it's going to uh, have no value in the future. But does that mean it has no value today? It doesn't mean that. But what does it mean? If you're the owner of this hotel and you're considering upgrading to make the hotel nicer or expand it to make it bigger, this risk is an important calculation. If you think that the payback period of this investment is longer than the lifetime of the hotel, you probably won't do it. And so one of the first things we might expect is a hotel in this situation is going to underinvest for the future. If it underinvests, then it saves the money from investing. And actually, its cash flow could be improved by the fact that it doesn't have to invest in the future. Second of all, you might expect that other hotels would face the same problem and come up with the same solution, in which case you might find that there is a shortage of beachfront luxury hotel rooms, in which case the price is likely to go up. Economists are happy to say that when the supply is reduced, the price goes up. The law of supply and demand. This is true even though, so the profits are going to go up, and that might be uh, temporary, but it might be good news for the hotel owner. 
What about investors in this hotel? The hotel owner might sell shares of stock or he might already have done that. So are these investors dismayed by what the future of the hotel looks like? Not necessarily. There is some price which it gives value to these stocks, and that is the cash flows. In finance, we think that a natural price for an asset is the present discounted value of future cash flows. We don't usually say until the asset is destroyed, but let's just include that as part of the expected value calculation. So the present dis expected discounted value of cash flows is a natural price for the stock for this asset. And in general, we would expect, because when the asset is destroyed, stock price is going to be worth nothing. However, what happens to the cash flow is it's often redistributed back to the owners of capital, paid out in dividends or, or buybacks, and so investors actually will receive the full value, and it would be exactly the, uh, the calculation that the, what they expected when they bought the stock. There are things that might, of course, change the value of this stock. If the terminate, if this ending point changes in time, then if it moves out in time because the sea level starts rising more slowly, then it's going to go up in value, and if it shrinks, it will go down in value. If demand for hotel rooms goes up, it's going to increase the value of the stock, otherwise it'll go down. So I'm going to give this hotel, the risk that this faces this hotel, a name. I'm going to call it termination risk. And so when we talk about termination risk, I'm thinking about some asset which has an uncertain future terminal date. And I'm going to convince you, try to convince you, that this is what the fossil energy sector looks like oil and gas exploration and, and development faces termination risk. So there are a couple more characteristics that are going to come up when we think about how termination risk really works, if it really is the energy sector that's doing it. Um, uh, The first sentence is really saying this is from an economic point of view, the, uh, that the marginal product of capital, is, which is what investment goods is, depends on how long this capital is going to be active. It might depreciate over time, but basically you get a benefit for multiple years from an investment that you make today. And therefore, if the number of years is short, you might not make so much of an investment. Similarly, if output increases, the value of the marginal product of capital goes up. But it won't go up very much because if you only have a small number of years, your benefit from having additional capital is a lot smaller than if the termination risk is further out. So we might expect the supply elasticity to be small. You might wonder whether the owner of this hotel can buy insurance. And perhaps he can buy insurance, but it will be expensive. And as it gets closer and closer to the termination date, the price of the insurance should go up dramatically. We expect to see insurance rates rising for this kind of uh, property, and that might actually ultimately lead to un, uh, uninsurability of the, of the property. Finally, when a small number of firms face termination from the same event, then the ability to reduce demand might depend on whether they can coordinate their actions whether they can extract more monopoly profits temporarily while the business exists. That might suggest that consolidation actually might have returns to scale in terms of 
managing these companies, but it also might have returns to uh, benefits in terms of uh, extracting more monopoly profits in the time that's remaining. And one of the things that we have seen in the news a lot recently has been some of these oil companies buying each other. And that, uh, you might say, is evidence that they don't think that this termination of risk is really going to happen. But let me ask you, is that for the point of view of the buyer or the point of view of the seller? The point of view of the seller is that he is getting out before the termination happens. The, from the point of view of the buyer, he's not expanding the amount of oil and gas that's being extracted. What he's doing is getting control of the whole sector so he can actually, in an orderly way, reduce the supply. So I think this is kind of consistent with what we're seeing. So along these lines, is termination risk really plausible for fossil energy companies? Well, let me show you a picture. This is a picture that the International Energy Association uh, post, posed, which is, a quest, which is trying to tell you what is likely to happen if we're able to achieve the goals of the Paris Accord of getting to net zero by 2050. So 2050 is on the right of this picture. We are actually basically at the high point of this curve where blue is coal-fired electricity, uh, aqua is uh, unabated natural gas, and oil is uh, in green. So this is just electricity generation, but it's something similar for other uh, uses, such as transportation and so forth. So what this picture says is, we need to get from where we are to 2050 in basically 25 years. How are we going to do it? And they talk about the phasing out this, phasing out that, and so forth. But this picture, if you're the CEO of an energy company, tells you the horizon doesn't look that good. If this picture is really going to happen, your business goes away in 25 years, or maybe before. Now, we may be skeptical that this is really going to happen, and the energy CEO may be skeptical this is really going to happen. But that's what a risk is. A risk is something that might happen, but isn't for sure. And do you take it into account when you're behaving in your behavior today? And that's what we're going to ask about. Do we see evidence that energy companies and investors think that there is some possibility that this future is going to actually happen. The other side of this picture, of course, is the investment in renewables, which is supposed to increase dramatically to make up the difference in how much energy uh, electricity we produce. And of course, that's also a problem. We're not really sure it's going to happen uh, this way. But you might wonder whether this energy company that I think faces termination risk should actually use some of its cash flow to turn green, to start producing renewable energy. In fact, I've asked my audiences over the next the last several months, do you think that this hotel owner should start producing electric vehicles. That would be a way of turning his hotel into sort of a green machine. And what I think is that hotel owners are probably not very good at making electricity, electric vehicles. And so investors probably would rather have the cash back and let themselves invest in electric vehicles than expect the hotel owner to do that. And so it would probably reduce the stock value if they would decide to do that, if he would decide to do that. Similarly, I think that oil and gas producers may not have a comparative advantage in uh, renewable energy. 
One's electricity, one is drilling in the, in the oil. They take place in different locations. They, one's transmitted on the grid and so forth. I'm not sure there's that much connection. So what do we see when we look at the data? Well, here's a picture from the last uh, 20, I don't know, no, actually it's 70 years. So you see at the bottom, we have some growth in nuclear power and renewable energy, but up in the top is the, the pattern for natural gas, crude oil, and, and coal. And the good news from an environmental point of view is that the coal curve is turning down. And it looks like it peaked in maybe 2005 or 2007, something like that. So that suggests that the coal industry looks kind of like the IEA picture. It's headed for, you know, you could extrapolate that. It's going to get to zero probably even before uh, 2050. But the oil and, and natural gas are rising dramatically, and that doesn't look at all like our picture. So this is a worry from an environmental point of view, and it's a worry from a policymaker's point of view. So how are governments around the world supposed to get their energy down to net zero by 2050? Paris Agreement said that if we can all do this, that's good enough that we can avoid the worst effects of climate change. So each country can follow whatever route they want to get themselves to net zero by 2050. And the question, what are their choices? So here is my list of four possible policies. And these are sort of generic types of policies. We could tax carbon emissions. And this is the favorite policy of most economists because we learn, as soon as we learn about externalities, we know, like emissions, we, we learn that a great solution to that is to tax the externality. The second one is to subsidize renewable energy. That, of course, is also going to have the effect of making it cheaper and ultimately competing away the advantages of fossil energy. A third is to regulate emissions, basically saying you can't do some kinds of activities which create a lot of emissions. And this is uh, a regulation that could be done by many different levels or types of government, and we see lots of it. We see regulation of car emissions. We see regulation of uh, building standards to require more insulation. We see regulation of, uh, of power plants. They can't emit as much uh, CO2 as they used to and whatever. So emissions is the, regulating emissions is the third topic. And the fourth one I've put down here is called hope. So what is hope? Is that a policy? Well, it's not really. It's what you do if the first, if you don't like any of the first three. You hope that it'll happen by itself. And by itself really means that you hope that we're all such good people that we will decide whether we're consumers or employees, investors or corporations, we will voluntarily adopt greener behavior. Consumers go to the supermarket and they decide they're going to buy something which has a smaller carbon footprint if they can figure out which thing that is. Employees might decide they only want to work for a company that is green or, or is environmentally aware. And that is a pretty tough decision too. Investors, I'm going to talk a little more about, but they are struggling with the idea of what is a sustainable investment anyway? How does ESG work? What am I getting if I invest sustainably? 
And of co course, corporations are stuck with saying, you know, we need p good public relations, maybe we better do something. Does it have to be real or can I just pretend? It's, and uh, economists know that the peril of this is the free rider. The free rider is the person that doesn't do any of these things while all the rest of us do, and he gets the benefits without taking the costs, and free riders will make it impossible to have hope, to, to hope that this will really be sufficient. Okay, this is my uh, quick discussion of hope. So all these policies affect businesses. They affect businesses because they all lead to decarbonization, and decarbonization means some businesses have to really change the way they work or go out of business. And so there are some, some companies are going to be impacted dramatically by any of these policies, while as others will not. So we call this transition risk, and this is very sector specific. It depends on what kind of business you're doing, how much transition risk you face. And fossil energy companies face a lot of transition risk because it's really the ultimate transition risk if it's, got, if it's termination risk, that they are going to go out of business. So fossil energy companies and, and companies that produce products that they, where they can't reduce emissions are likely to find that their, their business model goes away. Okay, so now, how do we do asset pricing for these kinds of assets in this kind of world that we're talking about with these long run risks? Well, the first simple answer is that a stock in some company that faces a long run risk is not as good a stock as one for a company that doesn't face this long run risk, if everything else is equal. So the price ought to be lower. And when the price is lower, since everything else is equal, that means the, the returns on that stock are higher. So the expected return is higher, and so we call this a risk premium, that in order to get people to own stocks which have faced this long-run risk, they should get a risk premium. We, this is elementary finance, and that turns out to be the case. When, uh, when you look at uh, stock prices across, in cross sections, it turns out companies that emit more CO2 actually have higher expected returns, which is the risk premium. But many of us don't want to own those companies. What we want to do is we want to disown those companies. We want to have portfolios that are short the high emission assets. And the reason for doing that is we want a, a hedge portfolio. That is, we would like a portfolio which has the property that if climate becomes really bad, my portfolio is going to do better than the rest of the market. So I want to be short climate sensitive, climate risk exposed stocks and long stocks that are uh, in high reward will be rewarded or do well when climate gets bad. So that's a climate hedge portfolio, and that is going to underweight these same stocks that are getting the risk premium. So that means that these the hedge portfolio is going to have a negative risk premium and therefore have lower returns than the rest of the market. So if a climate hedge portfolio is what a, a natural thing for an investor to want if he wants to reduce his exposure to climate risk, how do we do that? Well, here's a family picture of uh, backpacking in, in the Sierras, and you can see it's a lot of work making hedge portfolios. So um, 
the thing that we have to do is we have to figure out which firms are going to be hurt by transition risk and which firms are not. And we want to underweight the ones that are going to be hurt and overweight the ones that are not and the ones that are prepared for climate change. And that kind of portfolio will have a negative expected return because it's got a negative risk premium, but it will have the benefit that when there is news that the climate is getting worse, this portfolio will increase. And that's how, that's how the hedge works. So how do we do this? Well, there are really two general approaches. One approach is to use characteristics of the firm, such as, such as data from ESG. ESG stands for Environment, Statistics, Social, and, envir and uh, Governance. So Environment, uh, Social, and Governance factors have to do with how exposed a company is to climate risk and other kinds of long-run social uh, costs. The trouble is ESG data is pretty unreliable. It's typically supplied voluntarily, and the coverage is not very good. And even the part that is done sort of in a quantitative way, um, such as uh, emissions themselves, may have big uh, problems when you talk about emissions of the supply chain, uh, either upstream or downstream, and, and then it becomes very difficult to figure out who actually is emitting a lot. So if you can't do it using firm-specific data, how can you do this? So the second approach is to what we call statistical approach, which is to say, let's take a look at what the stock market does when there is news that the climate's getting worse. It might be a big storm, it might be a policy introduction into Congress or, or whatever that makes it look like the climate is getting worse and the probability that we're going to do something about it is going up. Well. Some stocks should go up on that news, and some stocks should go down. We want to be invested in the ones that go up and short the ones that go down. So we can use that kind of statistical test to see which stocks we want to overweight and which ones we want to underweight. So let me show you two of the hedge portfolios that we use in, at the VRI, because we're going to talk about these in just a moment. The first one is a simple weighted average of three exchange-traded funds. SPY is the Standard & Poor's 500. It's a, it's a broad-based index. Um, so this is long the SPY and short 70% of a coal ETF and 30% of a broad energy ETF. So this is a portfolio which basically thinks that the coal sector is going to go down if the climate gets worse, and the energy sector will also go down if the climate gets worse. And, but the SPY will actually include lots of other stocks which are going to uh, do all right. They're not going to be impacted by climate change. So this is what I, this is, I think, the fundamental characteristic approach. Let's take a look at the, what kind of business model are each of these firms in and decide what we think will happen when, they, uh, when the climate gets worse. The second is what we call a climate efficient factor mimicking portfolio. And there is a literature on factor mimicking portfolios and we're taking a piece of that and applying it to uh, climate. This is in a paper by Denard, Brian Kelly and myself. So you probably know that there are lots of funds out there that say they're sustainable. In fact, they're, they're, globally there are like thousands of funds that say they're sustainable. And the question is, are they? Or can we figure out which ones are 
or maybe we can put together a portfolio that's actually better than the average and maybe as good as the very best of these funds. So this is an idea of trying to figure out which ones should go into this portfolio. And the way we're going to do that is to take each of the many sustainable funds, regress its stock return on a few standard risk factors, and then on climate news. News that the climate is getting worse. And the coefficient on that climate news is an important thing which we use to assess how good this uh, sustainable fund is. So what we want to do is construct a portfolio which takes positions, long positions only, in one or more of these funds in order to make the overall for portfolio have as small as variance as possible, but as high a correlation as possible with the climate news. So this is our approach to doing this statistically, but we're using existing funds, each of which is trying to do this job, but we're trying to find the one that does it the best, that are the ones that do it the best. So we're going to do this using just a rolling window of data, say a year of data. We'll calculate this portfolio. We post it on VLAB, and you can see what this portfolio holds. We leave it there for a month, and then we update. So what's What's in this portfolio? Well, if you look last November, it had three, three f funds in it, uh, and those, those are the weights. If you looked in December, it had two, January it had two, and previous January it had two. It turns out, if you, uh, if you look at the website I don't know, sometime today, but I'm not sh sure. Uh, certainly this morning, it had February in it, and February only has one asset in it, which is emission certificates from the California Exchange Traded Fund, uh, Emissions Trading Fund. And I don't know what it's going to have for March, but I think that calculation is going to be done today, and it will be posted on, on the internet to see what investors might want to hold for the month of March if you're going to do this portfolio. Okay, so this is, this is our second hedge portfolio. How do these work? Well, if you look at the, the long run, you can see return, volatility, and sharp ratio for these funds. And you can see that the, the benchmarks are the uh, ACWI and the S&P overall. And you can see that they had nice returns over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, volatility, 18 to 20 percent. Sharp ratios, 0.1 to 0.3, something like that. So this is kind of a benchmark of what we're talking about. The stranded asset portfolio had a return uh, a little higher than the ACWI. Uh, it's a shorter time period, and its sharp ratio is actually a little bit higher than the other two. The climate efficient factor mimicking portfolio is the last one, and you can see that also has a sharp ratio in the same range. So it has a positive, nice return over the whole sample period, a little more volatility. Um, the Next to the last one is what would happen if you shorted the whole energy sector rather than specifically coal, and you can see that performed worse. In fact, it has a negative return on average over the last 25 years. So um, that the, the two that I just talked about are, although they're supposed to have negative return if there is no news, given the news we've seen on climate change, they actually have positive return, which is fairly healthy. Um, and this is kind of what I think we should expect. It seems to me 
The market has increased its concern about climate change. We've seen more and more information about it. It makes sense that the hedge is working. It's increased in value as a result of the fact that the, we're more serious about climate change than we were two decades ago. If you look at the one-year return, you see they do, they're doing much better. The returns are much higher. Look at these sharp ratios. Even the benchmark has a sharp ratio bigger than two. So stranded asset is also bigger than two. The uh, efficient, the CEP factor efficient uh, portfolio is almost one. So, well, this, is a, this has been a good year. However, last year was a bad year. So I don't know whether any of you invested in, in uh, sustainable funds and watched what happened to them last year, but they, did, they got really beaten up last year. And this is a similar table done last, a year ago, last March, and what you see is all these things had negative returns, negative sharp ratios, but the, uh, the sustainable portfolios, the stranded asset and the CEP, had returns that are minus 25 and minus 23% really beaten up. So when I get to the current event part of my talk today, which is, is coming up pretty soon, um, we're going to want to talk about this. What happened? So you might think about, hmm, what happened last year? OK. So before I get to that, though, I want to tell you very, very briefly what we use these for. So one answer is we could invest in these directly. These are investable portfolios. A second answer is we could invest in portfolios that have a high beta on these hedge portfolios. That is, they have performance that's quite similar once you've taken out con uh, common risk factors. A third is we can test for whether individual stocks are green or whether they're, if they're uh, being advertised as green, whether this is greenwashing. And fourth, we can stress test banks to see whether bank stocks look green or brown, and that will depend on whether the banks are lending to green industries or brown industries. So I'm going to give you more or less one slide on each of these topics. Um, Oops, there we go. Um, so here's, I, I told you, I guess, that we follow a bunch of sustainable funds. So here are the top 10 out of 200 funds that we follow. And in the same form as I showed you for the benchmarking, we've got return, volatility, and sharp ratios. Then we have two columns which have to do with whether they are correlated, simple, simple correlations with the news. Then we have a cap M alpha, but what I really want to show you are the last two columns, which is where we regress the returns on these funds on Fama French factors and a couple of other things, and the two hedge portfolios to see whether these have the character, the green characteristics that we think are embodied in these hedge portfolios. And so the beta on the stranded assets is in, is in light green, and the dark green is the beta on the climate efficient factor mimicking portfolio. And so I've sorted all these 200 funds based on their beta on the cap, the CEP. And so if it's more work than I want to do to invest in the CEP. I might invest in stocks that have a high beta on it, uh, not stocks, uh, funds. And these are the top ones on this thing. And lo and behold, the top fund is uh, actually a solar ETF, and then next is a clean power, and then a clean energy, and a clean energy, and a battery tech, and so forth. These are the kinds of funds that you might expect to be associated with a climate hedge portfolio. 
Suppose we do the same thing for stocks. And in this case, we do it with four hedge portfolios, but that's okay. And we're gonna rank the stocks by their, the average beta on these hedge portfolios. So if the betas are big, we say it looks green. If the betas are bad, we say it's brown. So here is a, a regression using five years of data on the, all the stocks in the S&P 500. And the ones on the left are the top ranks by this method. And the ones on the right are the bottom rank by this method. And you can see if you look on the right hand side, all these uh, oil and gas companies are kind of aligned up together. And you'll see a bunch of them that have now bought bought each other, uh, this, this merger that I've been talking about, are on the right-hand side. But on the left are companies which basically aren't in the energy business. They're services and insurance and different, different products, but they're not really exposed to the kind of transition risk that we're talking about. Uh, if you talk about, if you do the same thing for banks, what we're going to learn is whether the market views these banks as having returns which are correlated with the hedge portfolios or with climate risk portfolios, which are the inverse. That is a negative correlation. So this is a way of, calcul of doing a stress test on banks. And stress tests are used by regulators all the time to try to figure out whether banks are taking on too much risk, whether we have a risk of a financial crisis coming up or something like that. Well, there is a ton of interest now in whether the banks are too exposed to climate risk. Are they lending to the fossil energy companies in a way that's going to make them exposed to transition risk. One of the things that would be such a shame would be if we could get our governments to really take seriously climate change. And then that would turn out to hurt these, the same industries that the banks have invested in so that the banks would then fail, so that our policy to mitigate climate risk would be exactly the same policy that would create a financial crisis. That would be a disaster. It would, or it would, be, it would be a shame anyway. And so what we want to do, what regulators are trying to do is make sure that doesn't happen, that the, that the banks are not so exposed to uh, climate risk that we can't really mitigate climate change. So here's what, they sh what we find when we look at Citibank. This is the climate beta. So this is telling us how much Citibank stock is changed when our hedge portfolio uh, changes. And positive here means that it's exposed to climate risk. It's, it's uh, correlated with the risky part of the, of the stranded asset portfolio. And you see it went up fairly substantially during uh, 2020 and 2021, which is really the pandemic period in the US. Well, it's a pandemic period in pretty much of the world. And I think that's not too surprising because the pandemic was a time of extreme change in the same kind of way that an extreme decarbonization would happen. We reduced our driving, we reduced our flying, we learned how to zoom instead, and oil companies and gas companies found that their market really dropped dramatically. They lost money, the stock market value of those companies collapsed, and it looks like that impacted Citibank stock uh, over this period. It turns out if you look at banks all over the world, which we do, including in Japan, they almost all have this rise in 
2020 and 2021. It's, it was a global effect that to see these bank stocks were uh, increased uh, exposure to the climate risk. But it dropped down a lot in, in Citibank, and that I, could be because Citi became aware that these stocks were risky. It could be that they became aware that the Fed was going to try to stress test them on this if they could figure out how to do it. It could also be because the fossil energy sector is not trying to expose itself to the long run as, as much and doesn't need as much uh, to borrow as much against uh, for, for long-term exploration and drilling and so forth. I don't know which of those explanations is really the right, but we do see it starting to go back up again on the right-hand side. And when we look at the world as a whole, it's not come down as much in between. It went up during the financial cri in the, the pandemic, but it didn't come down as much as it did here in the U.S. stocks. And so it's something that we think is worth paying attention to and monitoring. And as I say, you can, you can look up uh, your bank, somebody else's bank and the rest of the world to see what their climate betas are doing and what climate adequacy is looking like. Okay, so now, I don't know, I can't remember what, am I, am I uh, over time yet? Yes, oof. Okay, so, do you want to know about this? <laughs> um, I'm going to, I'll try to be real as fast as I can, okay. Um, so you know Star Wars, Emperor, he said something like, everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. And this, is this? the way he saw it was likely to happen? That's the question. Should we have foreseen this? Okay, so I showed you that in sustainable funds underperformed last year. It's not surprising because the energy, energy sector outperformed and they were underweight energy. But that doesn't answer the question of why the energy sector outperformed. And I think my explanation for that is the termination risk. They recognized that termination was coming. They underinvested in the future. They have enormous profits. The prices of energy went up because they reduced supply. And it all looked like the stranded asset hotel. OK. Is there any way we can kind of confirm that a little bit? I mean, that's sort of speculative, right? But that's what we want to do. So um, let's take a look at price earnings ratios. You know, I, I said Tesla was 60 and GM was five. What are, what's the energy sector look like? If there's termination risk, we expect price earnings ratios to be low because you're not going to get this for very many years. Okay, so what's, what's it look like in 21 and 20? This is sorted by sector, and you can see the energy is all the way to the right, the lowest price earnings ratios. That suggests that investors believe in termination risk for the energy sector. They're not willing to pay very much for a stock even though it's got a lot of earnings. The same thing is true for book value, but book values basically often include things like, like reserves and stuff like that, which have decreased in value a lot, but the book value hasn't gone down. So if you look even just today, or, or well, actually last month, uh, of all these sectors, this is now sorted by price earnings ratios. The price earnings ratio for energy sector is eight. However, if you look at its growth in earnings per share, which is in over the last five years, which is the green circle, 
it went up 26%. But the expectation is it will go up over the next five years by 1%. Well, this, is a, this looks like the IEA picture. It was doing well in the past, and we expect it to do badly in the future. Uh, if you look at different parts of it, you'll see that thermal coal is actually the worst. Uh, I don't know about uranium, that, but anyway, most of these are pretty low. Um, can I take this to a bigger place? There are impacts on countries that we can talk about in the same way. Some countries are based, their whole economy is based on oil and gas. So termination risk affects this country in a very dramatic way. It may lose all its revenue. You can think about the Middle East as an example of this. These Middle Eastern countries, revenues pouring in. What are you going to do with it? They're trying to diversify their economies. They're investing in, in services, transportation, golf, soccer, all sorts, of, all sorts of things to try to make their economy is more resilient and, and pre prepared for termination risk. It's the natural thing to do, and I don't know whether they'll be successful, but they're racing against the clock to get this done before tea time comes. What about Russia? Russia is another country with a dominant oil and gas industry they're following a different strategy. I think Russia also faces termination risk of its dominant industry. And it has reduced its energy supply to the rest of the world. It's doing this at the same time that it's invading Ukraine. Why is it invading Ukraine? I think this is also to try to diversify its economy. Ukraine provides agricultural and, and other kinds of resources that, that Russia doesn't have. And uh, it's, it's, it's the breadbasket for Africa and for a lot of the world. And Russia would like to have this as part of its economy again. So and I, on top of that, I think that, that Putin must realize that his economy is going to be weaker in 10 years than it is today, and Europe is going to be more self-sufficient on energy front in 10 years than it is today. So he had, if he's going to do anything, he had to do it when he did it, and he did it, and I'm sure he was surprised that it wasn't easier than he thought. Um, but the net effect is energy supply from Russia has gone down a lot. But he is now selling his fossil energy at elevated prices, and the ruble has more than recovered. But termination risk is still coming. But in this transition, it looks pretty profitable. So if we're climate advocates, are we happy or sad about the current events? Uh, that's a little bit of. There might be mixed feelings on this. But basically, it's been always been clear that decarbonization is going to require, is going to be associated with higher prices for goods that are emitting a lot of greenhouse gases. That's what makes us buy less of them and buy something else instead. So decarbonization is associated with high energy prices, high fossil energy prices. When we're, we've been complaining about high gasoline prices, but as an environmentalist, high gasoline prices aren't really that bad because it makes people want to buy a Tesla. It makes people want to drive less. If you drive up to the pump and you say, oh, this is so expensive, I'm going to cancel my trip next week, you're doing exactly what environmentalists want to have happen. So we can blame Putin for this and get the environmental benefit. 
Would things have been different if we had a carbon tax? Well, it would have been different because these energy companies that are now making a killing by reducing supply would be paying taxes. They'd be paying taxes which would actually provide a revenue source for mitigating climate justice issues. We think it's a shame that, that poor people are the ones who are going to stop driving because the price of gasoline is high, but we do want to thank them for not driving as much, and wouldn't it be nice if we could provide an income supplement so they can buy something else instead? So actually, the state of California did that, and, and I think it was, it was uh, appreciated. They, they took some of the gasoline taxes that came in and, and did a per capita distribution to all California residents. And that we could have done the, if we'd had a, uh, a, an emissions tax, this high, uh, this high return on energy stocks on the stock market probably wouldn't have happened because the profits would be going to the government rather than to the investors in energy sector. And that obviously would have been a, a nicer outcome. It might not be too late, but but for this particularly particular cycle, we've missed it. Should we still invest in hedge portfolios? Well, I said it a year ago, yes, we should still invest in hedge portfolios. Today, I still say, yes, we should invest in hedge portfolios, and if I'd done it a year ago, I'd have been even happier about it. I mean, actually, I did do it a year ago, but I can't ask, suggest all of you go back a year. Um, so it's still a hedge because if the termination risk goes out a little further, you're going to go down in value. If termination risk comes in a little bit, then that's uh, appreciation of your hedge portfolio, and that's exactly what you want a hedge to do. So. Uh, these hedge portfolios are likely to outperform if decarbonization continues, and I think there are every reason to think decarbonization is going to continue, if not accelerate. And what is happening? Well, I think Putin has accelerated decarbonization. Europe has fallen all over itself to try to figure out how to get more renewable energy. The Biden climate bill has also accelerated decarbonization by providing very substantial subsidies to renewable uh, energy and, and, uh, and green technology. It's really a technology bill trying to stimulate green technologies. And the European Green Deal is uh, also providing a lot of money, a lot of it through green bonds, to uh, companies to help them uh, uh, move up the ladder and uh, also compete with the U.S. So I'm hoping that you put this all together and these policy pills will actually move us in a climate-friendly direction. So there's one more, one more thing I want to say, which is termination risk also could be applied to the planet. The planet could have, does have, a risk that the human race will be terminated. And this is a risk we're not going to be able to solve by diversification, by reduced investment, by anything. This is something that we have to deal with directly to try to reduce the probability of it. How do we reduce the probability? We have an agenda which is to get everybody to net zero by 2050. And if we can achieve that agenda, we'll, we think that we will have reduced the probability of termination risk dramatically. So that's a way to think about it. How do we get there? Well, we have the same free rider problem with countries that we have with people. Countries may feel like they don't have to do this because somebody else is going to do it. And the way I think about it 
is that if three or four of the biggest emitters can really work together to achieve their reductions, and this would be the US, China, Europe, and India are the four biggest emitters. If the four of these countries could actually collaborate and reduce emissions, then the rest of the world would probably come along too. And if a few countries don't achieve the same target, it, it won't actually be the end of the planet. It'll just be a uh, slightly slower reduction. So, you know, I want to leave you with a thought how important it is that the US and China and Europe especially, but also India, can actually talk about this, collaborate, work together to try to meet these uh, reduction targets. So here are my three of my grandsons looking out at a peaceful lake, which looks quiet today, but they really wonder what it's going to look like when they're our age. And we all wonder what it's going to look like, too. They're very worried we're going to leave them with a, a, a smoking planet. And so if we can figure out how to get along and uh, achieve our, our re reduc emission reductions, they'll be a lot happier. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Engel. I think uh, this is the longest lecture I have ever received from a Nobel <laughs> Prize winner. Let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> you see, one of my favorite soccer stars is Christian Ronaldo. Now I know why he is in Saudi Arabia. It is because of the termination risk. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. I am going to open the floor for questions. While you think about questions, I am going to just uh, ask one question. Do you think the time factor, uh, you know, when, when we think things are going to happen so far ahead of us, uh, uh, is, is, is the biggest uh, obstacle uh, that prevents us from dealing with issues of climate change? Or is it the profit motive? I think it's the profit motive. I think the problem really is that we have to do something today to make the long run better. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do today might sort of seem painful. And so, in that sense, it is the time horizon. But it also is profitable. And that is, you know, if, if we could, if we put on good policies, then business can adapt to those policies and they will provide decarbonized approaches to all sorts of consumer products that we need and want. So, I think. I think the, the, well, I do think the horizon is, is a, a big part of the problem because I guess most elected officials figure they will not be in power in 2050, and so therefore they're not going to be around to see <laughs> what happened. But my hope is that as citizens, we get sufficiently concerned that we elect people to office who will take this seriously and make the important policy changes that are needed. And so as we see storms and high energy prices and so forth, I think to myself, you know, this may convince a few more voters that the time is right to make sure we elect officials that are 
wise about climate change. Thank you very much. I'm going to open the floor for questions. Please raise your hands and uh, please introduce yourself, Ambassador. Number one, number two, number three, number four. <laughs> Uh, well, my name is uh, Sheikh Tijani Hajur, first counselor at Mauritanian Embassy, here in Tokyo, of course. Uh, it is just a comment. Well, uh, in uh, the four government policies, you concluded with a good one, which is hope. <laughs> <laughs> hope uh, is uh, an abstract idea. And you explain it, explain it by uh, active actions that has to be d have to be done by people. I mean, employees, c consumers, investors. And you said because we are good people. I'm not sure that we are good people, but <laughs> I think you are a good one. Your wife can approve me. I would like to add, because uh, hope is an abstract idea, I would like you to add to that prayers of religious people. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, Nose, thank you very much. Uh, uh, just yesterday, we had uh, an event last week uh, with Keio University, and one of the people came to me and said, you, the United Nations, University, uh, Univ United Nations people, your primary responsibility is to be optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> that is your responsibility. You know? Your responsibility. Uh, because if we are not optimistic, we are not going to... The reason why we're thinking about these things is because we are optimistic that we are going to be able to sort them out. If we're pessimistic, we wouldn't be able to do that. Thank you very much. Number two. Hello, uh, I'm Miri Aoki, and I'm from University of Tokyo, and I'm also majoring economics. I have two questions. One is from your study in 2023, uh, constructing a portfolio, maximizing a variable, uh, maximizing a correlation with a climate. And I have a question that, like, con companies that are talk, uh, uh, doing some actions uh, to solve a uh, uh, solve a uh, solve uh, a sorry <laughs> like uh, like like doing ESG actions mm -hmm. are usually a big company at least in Japan. So I want to ask that is there s some kind of like a selection biases in your portfolio that maybe uh, the one your the one the companies are selected might they are big companies or uh, the profit or like sharp ratio is higher. And the second question is: uh, Is hope a risk? Because many people are criticizing that, uh, like. Uh, Focusing on like carbon footprint are kind of trend. Like it's very fashion to like uh, pay attention to those kind of issues. So and because it might be a trend, so it might end. So is it kind of once is it sort of termination risk? <laughs> uh, this is my question. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Professor. Uh, you have the floor. Okay. Um. So do I, is there a bias toward, toward large companies? Well, in, in the selection of these portfolios, the actual stock selection is done by the portfolio manager. And what we're trying to figure out is whether the stock selection of one manager is better than the stock selection of another manager. So if one manager has a bias and, and doesn't select enough small companies, then we think that the second portfolio might actually outperform 
and would be then selected to be part of our overall portfolio. In other words, we don't have to address that particular bias or any other bias. I think, I think that if you really look at, at how these portfolios are put together, they're very different. They have, they have individuals have different kinds of views as to what ESG is useful for or what is not useful for, how to deal with unreporting companies and so forth. So we're thinking that if the best of them, if we can pick out the best of them, then we don't have to answer the question that you asked. Um, when we look at the greenwashing of individual stocks, um, we look, those were all S&P 500 stocks. So that you might say is a large cap universe. It's, it certainly doesn't include small caps, but it does include some medium sized companies. Uh, I think if you use ESG data to select your portfolios, you probably are going to get a bias toward large cap because I think big companies are much more likely to report. And so the SEC in the US is really trying to get uh, a regulation passed that requires uh, reporting emissions and a bunch of other things. And I think that's a good thing. But even better to me would be if we put on a universal carbon tax or something like that, then we don't need ESG at all anymore. In other words, if a company has high emissions, then they have high costs. And that company is going to be not very profitable. And we can see their profits. It means that we just are not going to invest in that company. And if, it takes, if we take two companies that have the same emissions, but one finds it easy to convert to electricity and the other one finds it impossible to convert to electricity, then once you put on a carbon tax, one of them will be much more profitable than the other one because they'll decide they just they'll convert so you you get the best you get the best outcomes if you can if you can uh, put in the public policy that actually adjusts for the uh, emissions uh, now you, there was a second question the, the second question was whether uh, the the emphasis on carbon, the reduction of carbon, is it uh, a trend or is it uh, something that people are doing because it's an important thing to do? Is it peer pressure <laughs> or is it something that people have internalized it, isn't it? Yes, like maybe if uh, I believe that like uh, focusing on like uh, environmental issue is like spiking so it might like go down so it, it's trend so mm. it, it's it's sort of risk i think and i want to ask is it is hope a risk in this case in this context well i i think i think this uh, whole area certainly has oscillations in it i mean the the interest in, in climate and the interest in doing something about that keeps changing over time, and it's, ver it's very political. You look at Al Gore's movies, you know, in the, from a decade or more ago, and, uh, you know, when he did those movies, there was a big collection of climate deniers that had ex all these explanations for why this really wasn't true. Today, we don't see any climate deniers, or at least they're not nearly so public anymore. But I think those things change. But what we're getting, and in the US it was very dramatic, is a backlash against ESG and, and sustainable investing. The st some states have said that BlackRock, which has been sort of outspoken on this topic, can no longer service any pension funds in their state, that they, and, and this is a law, 
I mean, I don't know how you pass a law like that, but anyway, uh, but anyway, there are some, there is a view that ESG is just um, we call snake oil or magic or something, black magic or something, I don't know what, but it is not a real thing mm -hmm. and investors are being fooled by thinking that it is. Well, it's not a coincidence, I don't think, that that movement has been exactly coordinated with the low performance of sustainable funds. And now that they're performing better, I don't hear so much about it anymore. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Number three. Thank you so much, Professor Engel. I'm Valeria Ramos from Mexico, a resident in Japan. And I want to ask you, how, uh, what do you think about the actual energy policy in Mexico during the last administration of the President López Obrador? As maybe you know, uh, the actual president uh, increased the, um, the fossil energy supply in Mexico. He's trying to uh, construct a new refinery in the southeast Mexico, and also Pemex bought a big refinery in Texas. What do you think about it? I don't, I don't know how can it explain it. I, maybe not <laughs> terminal risk, I don't know. <laughs> Please, yes, thank you. I, I know a bit about this, yes. Um, I, I feel like I would like to talk to Lopez Obrador about, about termination risk because I think he doesn't recognize that these, this is an industry which is really likely to go away. And uh, I think over the years, uh, Pemex has been um, what has been not as profitable as should have been. They keep putting more and more money and resources into it, which is, I think, the opposite of what should be done. And actually, uh, one of the people that, that I hoped would be the next president of Mexico, but is not, uh, I had a nice conversation with him last summer where we talked about what was the best thing for Mexico to do, and we agreed that it was to not expand Pemex, not to try to make Pemex more profitable, but to take advantage of what it had and let it move toward termination risk uh, without a lot of public expense. So building these, these new LNG terminals uh, has a slight possibility of being okay because LNG is likely to be the last fossil energy standing since it's, it's the least emitting and is what uh, a lot of electricity generation is using. However, I don't suppose that the cost-benefit analysis includes that kind of termination risk in, in uh, LNG either. And so I think probably it's not, it's, it's a mistake to be doing what he's doing. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, number four. Thank you very much for your great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my name is Shun Chonabayashi. Uh, I'm an associate professor at Soko University. Uh, my undergraduate, undergraduate advisor was actually uh, Professor uh, Yoshisa Baba, uh, who is also in, in this room, by the way. Uh, my questions are twofold. Um, are, we doing investing, are we investing enough to achieve net zero? Uh, that's the number. I mean, this can be a very broad question, so maybe you can answer in, in the way you, you can answer. Uh, but then if not, then what types of, because I think, you know, I really think uh, invest, uh, investment in ESG and you know, green portfolio, green energy is very important. So I wonder, uh, you also mentioned different types of policies in your presentation. So what type of policies are very key uh, to really encourage uh, more investment in green energy? and also, you know, ultimately achieve net zero. Thank you. Um, so there's a question of 
so the question, I guess, is what kind of policies are going to increase investment in, in green energy? And I think the most direct policy is subsidizing it. That's, what, that's certainly what uh, the pre our President Biden thinks. And I think there's a good argument for that. If you tax fossil energy, that will also give an advantage to renewable energy, but it might not be as direct and immediate as uh, the subsidy for renewable energy. There are issues with renewable energy that I think are very complicated and then this helps with. For example, why would anybody buy an electric car if there are no charging stations? Why would anybody build a charging station if there are no electric vehicles? You have to do both. Now Tesla has internalized that problem by doing both, but in many ways uh, renewable energy faces obstacles like the electric grid may not be good enough for renewable energy to be transmitted around the country. So the electric grid needs to be improved and so does renewable energy increase. So how do you do those both? Well, I think the subsidy is actually a partial solution to that. You subsidize each of them, and then they're not quite so exposed to the risk that the other one doesn't happen. Uh, and so I think that, that there is an argument for the subsidy as being more effective than uh, a tax on fossil energy. Mm -hmm. There is also interesting current discussion in, in economics about whether there is an externality associated with innovation. And if there is an innovation externality, which is that when one person makes an innovation, that actually stimulates other innovations, partly because they get to access the results of the first one, and partly because uh, the, the first one makes the second one more profitable too. So if there really is an innovation externality, then it makes sense to, foster, to uh, subsidize innovation. Well, I mean, uh, Professor, when you say that, you remind me of the psychological concept of a stick and a carrot. <laughs> so the stick here would be a carbon tax. Yes. The carrot will be a yes. subsidy. Which yes. one is much more effective? Yes. Yeah. That's the question. <laughs> That's the question. Uh, uh, one last question, number five. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. This is uh, Mototsugu Shimizu, um, cybersecurity engineer and researcher. And at the same time, I'm a, a second year doctoral student at Marymount University while I'm living in Tokyo. And uh, you listed uh, four factors to mitigate climate. Uh, change. The, um, the three of them, um, taxes, subsidies, and regulatories have, what do you say, a compulsion or a cohesion to let people uh, take actions. But HOP does not, I think. <laughs> so I'd like to ask you, uh, what were effective ways to transform people's hopes into actions? What do you think? <laughs> Yes. You know, we see that every day. We see ads for sustainable, I, I mean, you can't go to the grocery store without seeing some advertising organic eggs and somebody else advertising, you, you know, green, green ham or I don't know, something. So marketers spend money because they think consumers are interested. So um, if consumers were not interested, you wouldn't see any of this at all. And I think they spend money because they think investors are interested. And I know that BP, for example, had a 
big advertising campaign to convince investors that it was actually a green yep. energy company. They've stopped. I don't know whether they've given up or whether... whether <laughs> I, I know, think it, it didn't was work. Mexico spillage. You know? Yes. Uh, now it, it, all of us have forgotten. So, you know, I don't know whether you're talking about public policy or whether you're talking about corporate behavior or personal behavior. I think the more we understand about climate risk, the better decisions we can all make. But I do think that, that us acting as individuals in a well-informed fashion, um, as employees as a well-informed fashion, and as businessmen and investors well-informed, might not be enough. This transformation we're talking about here is big. And I don't think it can happen without public policy. Great, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, we have come to the end of the session. Let's give Professor Engel another warm and enthusiastic round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.